would that be, be all of our experience, that the sweetness of serving Jesus. Uh, Abraham has chosen 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting verse 29 through 31. And I will read that in your presence. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. At this time, we'd like to welcome uh, Brother Abraham to, our, to present the message for us today. So Harry Truman, not the president, another Harry Truman, he lived on Mount St. Helens. He grew up there pretty much his whole life. And you know Mount St. Helens, it would rumble every now and then, and you know, a few people would leave for a while, but then they'd come back, and you know, it would quake, and a few people would leave, but then they would come back. Well, Mount St. Helens in 1980 was starting to quake again, it was starting to rumble. And the authorities came again and they told Harry, listen, you need to leave, we think this is going to be the big one. I've been through this over and over again, you guys. It always goes back to normal like it was before. You guys are just, I don't know, but I'm just staying right here where I'm at and I'll all be just fine, it'll go back to normal. Well, in May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens finally exploded. With the power of several atomic bombs, it completely blew its top. It spewed 5,400 5, tons of ash into Earth's atmosphere. Everything was wiped out, trees, animals, plants. Harry, he was gone as well. You see the before and the after, the mountains completely caved in. Things didn't just go back to normal like they were before. There's going to be a time of judgment. The judgment's now, but the judgment's going to be over one day, and it's not going to go back to the way it was before. Revelation 14, 6. Turn your Bibles with me. I know the Bible verses are up there, but it's good to see it in our own Bibles, isn't it? Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 6, and the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. When this judgment period is over, it's not going back to business as usual, is it? So it's very important for us to understand this judgment. First of all, we read that it is the everlasting what? Gospel. gospel. So some people think um, that, you know, because we have Jesus in the four gospels, that's all I really need to know. I have the gospel there. I don't need to understand the book of Revelation and end time events as long as I know Jesus in the gospel. But let's not forget the gospel of our day. Jesus is still the center of the three angels' message gospel. But the Bible says that we need to fear God and give glory to Him. We're to touch a little bit more on the glory portion than I did in, that, in the Unlock Revelation meeting um, because we're a little more seasoned here. And worship Him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters. The next two messages. Revelation 14, 8. 
And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The three messages, judgment, Babylon is fallen, and the mark of the beast. They're contrasted by a group of people in Revelation 14, 12, that the Bible says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Are the commandments a central theme throughout the book of Revelation? They absolutely are. So I want to go back to that first angel's message, which is going to be the springboard of our study today. It says, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Well, first of all, we see that there's judgment. But because there's judgment, we should give him glory. Is the judgment a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. Without the judgment being completed, can we ever make it to heaven? No. So the judgment is actually a positive thing. It's sad that some people won't be on the right side of that judgment. But because there's judgment, it's a time we should give Him glory. Go with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 9, 24. Let's see what it means to give Him glory. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 24. Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this. So what shall we glory in? That he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So what is it that we glorieth in? That we know Him. So, to, to give God glory, we know what God's glory is, because when Moses wanted to see God's glory, he, Moses said, show me your glory. And what did Moses say, what did God say to Moses that He would pass before Him? His goodness. His goodness. And he says, you know, His goodness will pass before Him. And then his goodness passes before him, and the Lord declares the name of the Lord, which we know the Lord's name represents his character, because then he starts saying merciful, long-suffering, all the character attributes. And then God gives Moses what? The Ten Commandments. So we go from glory to goodness to character to Ten Commandments. We know ultimately to give God glory, we've got to keep the Ten Commandments, right? But let's start out at the beginning. If we want to give God glory, we need to know Him. So that as we know Him, His goodness can come inside of us. And as His goodness transforms us, it transforms our character. And as our character is transformed, it gives us the ability to do what? Obey. Obey the Ten Commandments. And so, by allowing Jesus to come in, we can glory in the Lord, even in the time of judgment. We can not be afraid because Jesus is our glory. Well, let's go to that scene of judgment found in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, we're going to be given a preview of what it looks like 
as this judgment's going on. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. The Bible says, I beheld. You know what that word beheld means? Behold means to look through my eyes. So Daniel is saying, I beheld. That means we need to behold. We need to look as if we're looking from Daniel's perspective here. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did seat did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. This is just a, I don't have a better word, but just a cool vision of what it looks like as judgment's going on. The fiery throne and the fire issuing before him. But the judgment is sat. They're getting ready to, this is a prophecy of what it's going to look like. Or revelation is a revealing of that same prophecy. That's why Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. So here we have the books open. You know, you know what's in those books? I'm in those books. You're in those books. Your family's in those books. There's a page found in those books. And your name is going to be found somewhere in those books. That's a solemn... Solemn thought. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. You know, some people say, because I'm a Christian, I don't need to be judged. I'm not going to be found in those books. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 10. The Bible says, For we must, how many? All, All appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We must all go before the judgment seat. And Acts 17.31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in what? Righteousness. righteousness. God has a righteous standard for his judgment. What is that standard? His law declares his righteousness. That's why Solomon, let's go ahead and turn here in our Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Here's a warning to the young men by Solomon, to the young people, really to everyone, but... Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. I don't exactly know how to take that, what Solomon is saying. I know he's not just saying, follow your heart. Maybe he's giving a warning and saying, you know, be careful if you follow your heart. Or maybe he's saying, you know, do what you believe is right. But ultimately he's saying, whatever you do, know that in the end you're going to be brought into judgment for it. So we should have a good time on this earth. We should be happy, cheerful Christians. But we should also know that the things we do are going to be brought into judgment. He goes on to say in Ecclesiastes 12, let's turn there. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. 
Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So Solomon, the second wisest person to ever live after Jesus, is going to give us the meaning of life in these two verses. Let us hear the whole conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's our purpose. I think, what is my purpose? It's to keep His commandments. Because by keeping His commandments, we're giving Him what? We're giving Him glory in the time of judgment. Because the Bible in Revelation 14, 7 says, For the hour of His judgment is come. What, what tense is that? It's present tense. And because of this present tense, when Jesus comes in Revelation 22, 12, the Bible says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward, what? Is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. God's very specific in these tenses, isn't he? When Jesus comes back, he doesn't need to, to try to figure it out at that time. He already has it. Let's go to the book of Daniel and see about this judgment a little bit more in depth. Daniel chapter 8, 14. And turn there. And as we're reading this, I just think of William Miller and the, and the other reformers at that time who, who God was leading these verses to in the early 1800s. Daniel 8.14 The Bible says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice what tense this is in. Future. Why? Because this is a prophecy written about 500 B.C. of what would come to pass in the 1800s. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. So there's three things I want to dissect in this verse here. First we want to see, first of all, what is this sanctuary, number one. Number two, what does it mean that it needs to be cleansed? And number three, why 2,300 days, and what does that mean? First of all, the sanctuary, the portable building. And it must have been amazing to see this thing raised up and taken down and carried with them. They had to be organized and ready to go. When the cloud moved, they had to move. This was a portable building. There was the outer courtyard, I could just go here, the inner courtyard, and then, of course, the most holy place. And the most holy place is where the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, took place. Every day of the year but one, they would sacrifice animals. Every day of the year but one, the blood would be taken into the sanctuary. And the sin would be transferred from the sinner to the lamb, to its blood. The blood would be sprinkled. The sin would be transferred to the sanctuary. The amazing part about that is that the, the person who sinned, the guilty party goes free. The victim, the sacrifice, takes the guilt. And now it's God's problem, right? He has to do the rest. Isn't it amazing that Jesus would take your problem? on himself. Will we take other people's problem on ourselves? The sanctuary in Exodus 25, 8, the Bible says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God needed to be with his people to change his people. In Exodus 25, 9, something special about the sanctuary. The Bible tells us, According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So they were making it according to a what? A pattern. Have you ever been um, to a building that was to be opened in the future and then have a pattern or, or a model of the building? Um, 
I live in I lived in Westerville, and they were getting ready to remodel the Westerville Library, and so it was closed for some time, and I didn't know, so I came and was going to go to the library, and um, it said closed, and then there was this little model building of all the renovations they were going to do. Now imagine with me for a second about this pattern, this model. Imagine you were shrunk down to the size of this model. You know, honey, I shrunk the kids a long time ago. Saw that. And you know, in this model, there were little cars, there was a parking lot, there were little trees, there was a little entryway into the, into the fake building. So imagine you shrink yourself down to that size. Could you get in one of those cars and drive? You get in, but you can't drive, right? Could you go into that little model library if you were small enough and check out one of the books and take it home and read it? No, right? There was no, there was no books. Why? Because it wasn't a real working library. And the sanctuary wasn't a real working sanctuary. It was just a model of the real working sanctuary that was up in heaven. And what I mean by that is Yes, the priests had work they had to do on a daily basis, right? However, did the sacrifice of animals ever forgive anybody's sin? No. The, the sin problem was what the sanctuary was for. Um, the plan of salvation. So in heaven is the real sanctuary. And so the cleansing of the sanctuary, we need to see Jesus inside of it. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. It's going to talk about that first sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible tells us, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances. That word also lets us know that the new covenant has ordinance as well. Of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. And if we were going to speak in all that particularly in detail, it would take a long time, wouldn't it? Because it was just so full of symbolism. But the first sanctuary had ordinances, and a covenant. Hebrews 9.24 tells us about the new sanctuary, or the real sanctuary. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Why is Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary doing what he's doing? It's for you. Jesus is not against you. Jesus is for you. Hebrews 4.14 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so don't look at God as this judgmental desiring to punish you when you sin. Listen, we all have faults, right? When we know we're, we, we have times we know we're falling into sin. But at those times, don't stay away from God because He is there for you. He knows what it's like. 
So therefore, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what the sanctuary is for. Daniel 8, 14, one more time. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So we talked about the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the one day on which the sins were completely blotted out. And now let's talk about the, the 2,300 days. And this is the prophetic key. We need to remember where these are so we can share them with people. Ezekiel 4, 6 tells us, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And Numbers 14, 34 says each day for a year. Because Numbers 14 was telling the story of how the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land. But before they went in, they decided to send 12 spies to spy out the promised land, right? And these spies went to the promised land. They saw the giants. They saw the humongous grapes. They saw the good and the, the challenges. And most of those spies brought back a bad report. And because of their bad report, they couldn't go into the promised land. And because of this report, God had to punish them. It was really them punishing themselves. But he said, listen, you guys brought back a bad report. Now you will have to spend 40 years in the wilderness wandering around. Why did they spend 40 years exactly wandering around? That's right. Because the spies spent exactly 40 days spying out the land. And so God appointed them one year for each day that the spies were in there. So the day for a year principle we're to find in prophecy, it works every time. So when we want to calculate 2,300 days, we realize we're really talking about 2,300 years. Okay. Daniel 8, 14. Let's make sure we're in Daniel 8 because we're going to go on to 16 and uh, beyond. Daniel chapter 8. And in Daniel 8, there's a vision with a ram and a goat and um, with a, a little horn power and um, the little horn um, persecuting and doing all sorts of corruption. And God wants Daniel to understand this vision. The, the very end of this vision comes to you know, Daniel wanting to understand and God telling them it will be for 2,300 days. But Daniel doesn't understand this. So God has to give him some more understanding. In Daniel 8, 16, the Bible says, God says, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. There's three things there. He wants to catch. Gabriel's job is to make Daniel understand. To understand what? The vision. And verse 27 goes on. God sends Gabriel. Gabriel is helping him to understand the entire vision, but as the angel Gabriel is getting to the juicy part about the 2300 years, Daniel understands the rest of the prophecy. He understands who the, who the horn was. He understood who um, the goat and the ram was, because God specifically said that you know the goat is Greece and the ram is Medo-Persia. There was no, nothing unclear about that portion of the vision, was there? No. But as Gabriel is getting to the best, juicy part, it's just too much for Daniel to take in. And what does he do? Faints. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. It wasn't enough to be astonished, was it? <laughs> He needed to understand it, and we need to understand it as well. So most Christianity doesn't link Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 together. They take Daniel 9 separately from Daniel 8, and that's why they do not come to the same conclusion we come to. They take Daniel 9 as its completely separate category. Now, some reasons we should take Daniel 8 and 9 together is, first of all, Daniel 9 comes exactly after Daniel 8. 
And Daniel didn't just write things that, oh, I'm going to put this here and that there. He specifically organized the book of Daniel. And you see as uh, Daniel chapter 2 through 7, um, they're written in, um, there's a special word for it, but Daniel 2 goes with Daniel 7, and Daniel 3 goes in Daniel 6, and Daniel 4 and 5 go together. So they link. So he's writing it in a special order, which I forget the special name. but Yes, yeah, it's a chiasm. That's exactly right. Thank you. But the other reason we can link Daniel 8 and 9 together is, first of all, in Daniel 8, Gabriel was sent. He was sent to give Daniel understanding and understanding of a vision, those three things. Well, let's read Daniel 9, 21 in our Bibles. Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So a few things. First of all, it says, while well, I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, I don't think that's a coincidence, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. Well, there's a problem because is there a vision in the chapter 9 of Daniel? No, there's no vision. So what vision of the beginning is it talking about? That's right. The vision in chapter 8. At the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and it goes on, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give thee skill to understand. So we find all three things linked together, knowing that now is the time for Daniel to understand the meaning of the 2300 days when the sanctuary would be cleansed, when the day of judgment would start. Let's go to Daniel 9. Let's actually read 23 as well. Daniel 9, 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment went forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So now Gabriel um, is going to give us the understanding of the vision. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's a big list of things they were to do during this time period. Notice it says to make an end of sins. Now some of the same things God's people are to do today. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Can you do that on your own? No. We need some help, don't we? Seventy weeks are determined. The word determined comes from the Hebrew word Choctaw, which means cut off. That means the seventy weeks are literally cut off from something else. Well, what are they cut off? From the 2300 days. So what we're going to see is that in this vision, the first section, which is for Daniel's people, who are Daniel's people? Israel, the Jews. The first 70 weeks are for the Jews. And the last part of that 2300 days is for the Gentiles. So the, therefore, the start of the 70 weeks is also the start of what? The 2300 days as well. That's right. So 70 weeks are determined for your people. Well, first of all, what does it mean 70 weeks? Well, a week is seven days. So if we go 70 times 7, we would have 490 days. And a day represents a year, so we have 490 years. When do these 2,300 years begin and end? Well, God's going to give us the exact starting point because if we have the length of the time period and we want to know when the end of the time period is, what do we need? Just the beginning date. Once we get that beginning date, we can just punch in the calculation, just like algebra. Easy. 
Daniel 9, 25. The Bible says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the Bible tells us until Messiah the Prince, there's going to be 62 plus 7 weeks. That's 69 weeks. And then Messiah the Prince is going to come. When does he come after? The decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So we see here there's going to be a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. 69 weeks or 483 years later, Messiah is going to come. So we need this starting date. Does anyone have questions on how we got those numbers? Again, 69 weeks times 7 days, 483 days or literal years. So from the decree to restore Jerusalem until the anointing of the Messiah would be 69 prophetic weeks or 483 years. So... Now, if God didn't give us this date, if God forgot to help us to understand exactly when this decree was going to be, then we wouldn't be able to figure out the prophecy at all. It's a good thing that God doesn't forget these things, isn't it? The Bible tells exactly when the, the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was. Go to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. It's right before Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 14. The Bible tells us, So the elders of the Jews built it according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. These were three kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, that gave commandment for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. Now, it was because they didn't, after these three you know, options, that then the book of Esther is written, and they almost, almost die. But here's the commandment, and Artaxerxes being the final and the fulfillment of the rebuilding um, stage of Jerusalem. We even have a copy of the exact letter that Artaxerxes wrote. In fact, um, Ezra chapter 7 literally says, this is a copy of the letter. And so this is fascinating to me because you can imagine this written on a scroll. It was at one point. This was written on a scroll at one point, and Artaxerxes was writing this down. And we have a literal archaeological manuscript found in our Bibles right here of a great king. So when people call this, I had somebody this week I was talking to say, I don't want to listen to just something in a book. This is a book which some of the most influential people throughout history have been a part of, chronologizing the history of the world. I mean, you have kings and princes. You have Moses, who is going to be king. You have... Um, Nebuchadnezzar, who was king of Babylon, some of the most prestigious empires to ever rule. You have Joseph, who was second in command of Egypt, the then most powerful. You have Daniel. This is pretty amazing. It says, To Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. Artaxerxes is saying, if you want to go, go ahead and leave. So all we got to do is go back into history because the Persians were very meticulous record keepers. History tells us that according to Ezra 7.13, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued in exactly 457 B.C. So now we have the starting point. 457 B.C., 69 weeks afterwards, 
Messiah the Prince would come. So all we got to do is add 483 years to the year 457 B.C. And we come to the year 27 A.D. In 27 A.D., Messiah would come. Well, what does the word Messiah mean? The Hebrew is Mashiach, and it means anointed one. So we got to figure out how was Jesus anointed? Acts 10.38, Bible tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Ghost. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost. And next thing, when was he anointed? At his baptism. Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22, the Bible tells us, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized. And we got to stop there for a second. Jesus, who knew no sin, committed no sin, was baptized, took part of this symbolism, which is to represent washing away sin. Why? What? As our example. As our example. And you know what else? It says baptism covers all those people who couldn't be baptized as well. Now, we, I have a Mormon friend that says, well, and this is why we baptize people for the dead, because they never were baptized. And so they do rituals. Where they, but Jesus covers those. He covers those baptisms. Jesus was baptized. And when he was baptized, the heaven was opened. A dove came upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this is when Jesus was anointed. If we only knew the year, if we only knew the day, then we could verify that the Bible is historically, factually correct. Well, it's a good thing Luke liked history, right? And wrote these things down. Luke 3, 1, right before the baptism, it says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and then it talks about all these other people who were reigning at that exact same time. Why? So we can go back and we can see historically when they were reigning at the same time and correlate them all to one precise date. And the most precise date we have is the first one because we have the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, who was the Caesar of most of the then known world. Do you think they were keeping records of that? When that was? Absolutely. And we know that it was in the year 27 A.D. was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar in which Jesus was baptized exactly 483 years after 457 B.C. He was Messiah. That's why Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. Because God always does things right on time. And when Jesus was baptized, he said in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus says the time is What time is fulfilled? Jesus is saying the time of the Messiah coming in the 70 weeks prophecy it's time. The 69th week is here. The time is fulfilled. And he was referring back to Daniel. He, and we know that, he, again, he referred to, back to Daniel another time when Peter asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother if he repents? Should I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus says no, but 70 times seven. Do you think Jesus was just making up numbers there? No. What's 70 times seven? 490, or exactly 70 weeks. Jesus was saying, I'm giving the Jewish nation exactly 70 weeks, 490 years, to repent. Going back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. I lost my place. Daniel 9, uh, let's give something. Seconds. Yes. 
verse missing. Let's go to 9, verse... Um, Let's go read verse 26 as well. Daniel 9, 26. And the Bible says, And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. So after 69 weeks he will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So what this is saying, sometime after... Jesus is cut off sometime after he's crucified. There's going to come a flood upon the city. We know waters represent people, armies. And an army did come in the year 70 AD and destroyed the city, just like the prophecy says. So sometimes after this, because notice how it's tying in the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the destruction of of that temple in Jerusalem. I think it's helping us not to get confused about the seven year tribulation and the restoring. I think that's what it's, God wants us to, to come out with. Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Jesus would confirm a covenant with many for one week. It's not the Antichrist confirming a covenant. It's Jesus Christ. We know because before Jesus was crucified, he had a supper with his disciples one last time called the Last Supper. And he took a glass of unfermented wine and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for many. He was declaring the covenant, which was about to be established as he was cut off in the midst of the week. And after Jesus was cut off, what happened to the sanctuary service? It was done. We know it was done because the temple and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and he caused sacrifice and oblation to stop. It was at the cross that Jesus was cut off for the sins of his people. <coughs> Just going through this, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 457 B.C., 483 years later, was the baptism of Jesus in exactly 27 A.D., Three and a half years in the middle of one week, Jesus was crucified on the cross in exactly 31 AD. And he was the Passover in 31 AD. So isn't it amazing that if the Jews would have been studying their Bible, they would have known exactly the year that, first of all, the Messiah would have came, that he would be baptized, anointed as Messiah then they would have known exactly the year in which Jesus would have died on the cross. Right in the midst of the week, right in 31. Not only that, but they would have known exactly the time of the year. Why? Because Jesus was the Passover. So it had to happen exactly on the Passover. And there were times of day in which the, the sacrifice, the oblation was given. There were two, the morning and the evening. And Jesus died during the evening sacrifice at the third hour of the day, exactly when the Passover lamb was being crucified. If they were studying their Bibles, they should have known exactly when the Messiah was coming. Now, I'm not saying we can know, because the Bible says we won't know um, the day or the year. But for the first coming, they should have. What's also amazing is that they should have known exactly how the Savior would have been killed. Notice Psalm 22, 16. The Bible says, They pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hands and my feet. This was written by who? David. David. Something special. It was written in about 1000 B.C. 
You know what didn't exist in 1000 BC? Crucifixion did not exist. It didn't exist until about 500 BC. So about 500 years before it even exists, the Bible talks about it. And then it happened to Jesus about another 500 years later. How can someone be an atheist knowing that? The Lord was crucified. And three and a half years later, after the crucifixion, God still gave the, the nation of Israel time to repent of their sins and turn back to them. But they would not. And therefore, the gospel went to the Gentiles in 34 AD. And Stephen was stoned. And Paul there witnessed his stoning of this holy man Stephen and forever changed Paul. And uh, Paul was the one that took the gospel to the Gentiles after that. So the 70 weeks is the first part of the 2300 years. This part was for the Jews. That 1810 is part for the Gentiles to get ready for it. 2300 years long. And so we know that if this date was right by our calculations, all we had to do really is go 457 and, and then add in the 2300 days and we can come exactly to the year judgment would start. But we don't want to just do that. Why? Because we want to check our math. And so we add in all those things in Daniel um, chapter 9 of the, the, the baptism, the cross, and going to the Gentiles. And so we check our math. So how much more sure can we be that in 1844 judgment started, the 2300 days was over and judgment had started um, in heaven. So we've been in judgment for over 150 years now, right? I want to talk about the seven-year tribulation for a minute because a lot of people um, at the meeting had this idea and we very gently um, touched it. Um, why do people come to the seven-year tribulation? You know where they actually get the seven-year tribulation from in the Bible? No? Anybody have another guess? They take the 69 weeks, and they take the 70th week, and they get the seven-year tribulation from the 70th week in Daniel chapter 9, what we just went over. And so what they do, there's something called the gap theory. So they understand that the, re re, um, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was in 457, or about that time, they think. But, and they understand that the first part had to do with Jesus dying on a cross. They get that. Some do. The ones that really study really actually get that part. But what they do is they say after, um, after Jesus died on a cross, there's this gap in history. And they take that 70th week, they cut it off from the 69. They take it in history and they put it all the way in the very end of time. It's kind of like this. Let's say you needed to borrow a thousand bucks from me. And I said, sure, I'll give you a thousand bucks. Give me 70 weeks and I'll have that thousand bucks for you. And so you're like, okay, um, that's exactly when I need it. So I'll wait. And you wait patiently and you know I'm going to give you that thousand dollars after 70 weeks. And so 69 weeks comes by and you're really excited. And then 70 weeks come by and you come to me and you say, Abraham, you have that money for me? And I'm like, sure. However, what I didn't tell you is between that 69th week and that 70th week, uh, there's this amount of time that's going to take me, and I'm not exactly sure how long that's going to be um, until the 70th week where I can give you that $1,000. How would you feel about that? You would, <laughs> you would say, that's not really 70 weeks then, is it? Well, it's not, because this is a time period, and so it just really doesn't make sense. The other thing they say is basically Messiah coming. They take that meaning rapture, um, being Messiah. And then the midst of the week, they take the, um, the, the confirming a covenant. Um, they say that's the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ, that confirms a covenant. However, there's never an Antichrist covenant with God's people in the whole entire Bible that I found. If you know of one, I'd like to see it. 
And probably the saddest thing is that they replaced Jesus Christ with the Antichrist as the central figure of end times. Well, everything revolves around what the Antichrist is doing. We need to know what the Antichrist is doing, but he's not the central figure. Amen. What Jesus Christ is doing is what we really need to know about, right? Mm -hmm. So when we get wrapped up, too much wrapped up in Antichrist and not enough wrapped up with Jesus Christ, is when we can start to go astray. The last thing they say in the seven-year seven tribulation is that the temple in Jerusalem would need rebuilt because they're going to rebuild the temple, then they're going to sacrifice in the temple all over again, and in the middle of the week, the Antichrist is going to revoke his covenant, which he had, and then there's going to be more tribulation, all sorts of things. Well, that would mean the temple would need to be rebuilt, but what they're doing is they're taking prophecies that were before the rebuilding of the temple and applying those to afterwards. The temple doesn't need to be rebuilt. Why? Because it was already rebuilt. In 457, the decree of Artaxerxes went out to restore and rebuild the temple. And then Ezra and Nehemiah and the other Jews, they went to work rebuilding and they rebuilt the temple. It's already been done. It doesn't need to be done again. 70 weeks is not a dual prophecy. How do we know it's not a dual prophecy? Some people always jump to the dual prophecy. Point. If the 70 weeks were a dual prophecy, there would need to be another decree to rebuild the Jerusalem. There would need to be another 483 years for the Messiah to come again. Everything would need to happen over again if it was a dual prophecy, right? It's not a dual prophecy. Fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment is come. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore He is able... To save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. If you come unto God by Jesus Christ, He is able to save you. Seeing that He ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's what Jesus is there for. So in the judgment, we do not need to be afraid. It's a solemn time, right? But the way we fear God and give glory to Him is by being in all of Him. By allowing Him to come into us by being happy. This is an exciting, exciting but solemn time in earth's history. When people first heard this message, they were really excited. When the Millerites learned this, the churches were filled. We need to have that experience again where people are flooding it and the Holy Spirit is going to descend and this message and the Babylon message and the Mark of the Beast message will excite the people once again like it was before. Have confidence in that. So in the judgment, don't fear. I want to tell you a story um, about a young Indian chief. When missionaries were first going to Alberta, Canada, um, to do missionary work in Canada, they came along a young Indian chief who fiercely opposed the Christian work. And he didn't want anything to do with Christianity. He didn't want it to be in his village. However, the missionaries kept working with him in that personal relationship, consistent like we need to do with other people. And that young Indian chief was one to the gospel. And he actually went from being one of the fiercest opponents to the gospel to one of the fiercest, best supporters of the gospel. However, one day, the young Indian chief found out that somebody in a neighboring village had killed his father. And this was a test for the young man. Because he's a Christian now. He can't act on revenge. And so he realized that he needed to find out who it was. And he needed to confront this person who killed his father. So he rides into town. He finds out who it is and he rides into town to confront the man. And he called for the murderer to come before him. And so they brought the murderer out. And there he is, standing face to face with the murderer of his father. You have killed my father, he says. What's he going to do? You have killed my father. And now you must be my father. You will ride my best horse. 
You will wear my best clothes. You will be a father to me, and I will be a son to you. What could the man say? My son, you have killed me. That is to say, by this demonstration of mercy and love and compassion, you have killed the old man that was. I can no longer be that man. God's demonstration of mercy and love and compassion needs to change us so that we can no longer be the old person that we were. His goodness needs to come inside of us because it is the judgment hour. Fear God and give glory to Him because or for the judgment is come. Has His mercy and compassion and love, the demonstration of the life of Jesus changed you? My friends, if we have sins we're holding on to, we need to just let them go. Let His goodness be our goodness. And His character be our character. And His ability to keep the Ten Commandments in our life be our ability. Would you like to make that commitment with the Lord today? Shall we kneel as we pray? Oh, Holy Father, You are good. You are amazing. You are loving. You are kind. And we thank You that we can look at the life of Jesus Christ. And we thank You that we can be changed. And we thank You, Lord, that it's the judgment because we know You're getting ready to make an end of sin and we're tired of this world. I pray, Father, that You give us victory in our life and that You give us energy and perseverance. We need the perseverance of the saints, the patience of the saints to get through these end times. Please, Lord, those of us who are struggling, those of us who need help, please, I ask you, send us your Holy Spirit to get us through this time so that in the judgment we cannot be found wanting, but in the judgment the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be seen to shine through. And on those books we will be accounted worthy. This is our prayer, Lord. We pray and we thank you for, this, for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.